Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 5, Episode 11, titled Miami Squeeze. It originally premiered on February 17th, 1989. You know, I always enjoy the episodes that have Miami in the title. And then I looked, I'm like, oh yeah, this is the only one. (laughs) (laughs) Told ya. (laughs) The writer for this episode is Robert Ward. That name should sound familiar. He is the co-producer. This is his sixth writing credit. He's got two more coming. It is also written by Peter McCabe, who has written four other episodes. This is his last writing credit. And Ted Mann. Now... I know you're thinking to yourself, Ted Mann, that's a ridiculous name. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's man as in M-A-N-N. Uh, oh, uh, related. So oh. Something, you know, Michael Mann. Michael's less responsible little brother or something, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Got to get him a job. <laughs> well, Mom won't leave me alone. <laughs> Come on, Ted, you're going to work with me. According to what might be a fake person, but probably not Ted Mann, aside from his funny name, he also wrote a lot of a lot of stuff. He won an Emmy for writing for NYPD Blue. Ooh. Yeah. Huh. And he also wrote something called Disco Beaver from Outer Space in 1978. Well, I think we have to find yes. that. <laughs> for research purposes, I need to see yes. Disco Beaver. <laughs> and it's from Outer Space, not just a regular Disco Beaver. <laughs> it's a space one. Yeah, a beaver from outer space. <laughs> not just a regular beaver. <laughs> a regular one. The director on this episode is Michelle Manning, who also directed Fruit of the Poison Tree and also like one of two female directors to ever direct anything for Miami Vice. I, I just you want know. to clarify. So you wouldn't watch a movie about a regular disco beaver? <laughs> no, no. It's got to be the outer space one. I don't got time for regular ones. <laughs> regular disco beavers are too common. Yeah, that's boring. <laughs> well, speaking of movies that Melissa watches... All right, John, like I mentioned, we actually have two bands you've never talked about before, which is a total 180 from what happened last week, where the music guests included someone who was the only music in an episode. What do you got for us this week? Thankfully, we've got some original artists. Stephen Moore, what, what's fantastic, too, this is the only time I will have to talk about them so we can actually just talk about them, and I won't have to try and make up something later. <laughs> we start out with Working On It by Chris Ray or Rhea. He's a British rock and blues singer and, singer and songwriter. He's known for his husky, gravelly voice and his slide guitar playing. Slide guitar, sign me up. (laughs) He's one of seven kids. He's from Middlesbrough. Uh, And the actually, the the Rhea or Ray or or whatever you pronounce his his last name, actually kind of famous that area for Camilio's Ice Cream Factory and Cafe Chain, which his family owns. Ice Cream too? Yeah, Ice Cream Factory and Cafe Chain. And he actually did, thought about not going into music. He was going to work in the Family Ice Cream Factory, which, I mean, <laughs> doesn't seem too bad. He ended up going into music. At age 21 or 22, he bought his first guitar. And this was in 1961. So he actually got kind of a late start in music. He, uh, he, he claimed to be self-taught. And he almost joined his friend's band at the time called the Elastic band but his dad convinced him that it wasn't that they weren't going to pay him enough money and talked him into coming back to the old ice cream family factory (laughs) ice cream that's where the money's at not music exactly eventually by 1973 he would join a band called magdalene uh and the lineup would include david coverdale who would later be a member of deep purple pretty quickly he took over writing their songs eventually singing as their singer just kind of stopped showing up (laughs) so he would go on from there and form his own band called the beautiful losers in 1975 they would receive melody makers best new newcomers award and even though it may not have lasted with the band, it did help him help him secure his first solo record deal. He would sign with Magnet Records, and ultimately the Beautiful Losers would split up in 1977. But in 1978, he would release his debut album, What Happened to Benny Santini, which would have his first single, Fool, If You Think It's Over, which is actually like his biggest hit. It would peak at number 12 in the u.s one of his only songs to really chart 
in the U.S. on the Hot 100 and would be number one in adult contemporary singles. Also happens to be the only song that he did not play guitar on. Take him a few years to get back to his uh, blues roots and then by 1983 he would start to find success in Europe and in the U.K. but not really break th- but he wouldn't break through to the U.S. again for a while. From 83 to 2000 he just released albums and all of his albums were pretty successful selling you know millions of copies like a lot of stories about stars just because he was selling millions of records doesn't mean he made a bunch of money he'd actually find out and fire his manager when he found out his man was making more money than he was off his music and it would take him from 83 to 87 to finally pay off 320,000 pounds of debt uh, to and actually start generating significant revenue because of how his record contract was and, and stuff with touring he was actually in debt until the 87 he had to release like four albums and sell like a few million records before he actually started making money damn and you know what's crazy is that there are so many stories that are like that too luckily for him that he would continue to be relevant this song in particular working on it that was released on 1988's new light through old windows would be his first song to chart in the u.s in a freaking decade his next album road uh, the road to hell in 89 would be mad in the uk things would get better for him financially and he that he would continue to go on his 93 album, Expresso Logic, not only hit the top 10 in the UK, but it was promoted in part with uh, Rhea taking part in the British Touring Car Championship. Now, ultimately, he'd be eliminated in the first round, but this wouldn't be the only time. Uh, it turns out he's a big Formula f- one enthusiast uh so like he's written songs for for like for like their opens and stuff and he's also shown up in in a couple pits of a few drivers as well in 2000 he would be diagnosed with actually pancreatic cancer Mm. so he he, you know his music career would kind of come to a halt his pancreas would be removed and he'd actually end up returning to performing he still has has had has medical issues from what it looks like they removed all, most or all of the cancer wow he would continue touring and releasing music until 2016 when he would have a stroke and well since stroke it's made things pretty difficult 2017 was his last stage appearance he collapsed on stage his last few shows have been canceled so we wish you the best chris by the way, what's kind of ironic with the with the whole cancer thing, only real film credit as far as an actor came in the 1999 comedy film Parting Shots, in which he played a character who uh, went out and got revenge after being diagnosed with cancer. But he's still he's still trying to do it. Our next artist is Tackhead with the song Hard Left. Gotta love a band name called Tackhead. <laughs> I knew you were gonna be all over that one. They're not just known as Tackhead, sometimes known as Fats Comet. <laughs> Come on, guys, let's talk about in- the industrial rap game from the 80s and early 90s. <laughs> Tackhead's core members were made up of Doug Wimbush on bass, Keith LeBlanc Blanc on drums, and Skip McDonald on guitar. Uh, would also feature producer and mixologist adrian sherwood uh he kind of drive this thing and you'll you'll kind of get why here in a minute tag hit was only technically credited with two albums they participated in four <laughs> the artist <laughs> The artists I, uh, that I just named that make up tag hit they began as members of the sugar hill gang's house band Damn. Yeah. If you don't, if you don't know who the Sugar Hill Gang is, the old lady in Happy Gilmore, the rap she starts, that's Sugar Hill Gang song. <laughs> that's not all they did. They also played the uh, background, the the instruments for DJ Grandmaster Flash's 1982 hits, The Message and White Lines, like his two biggest fucking songs. Sorry, like his two biggest songs. <laughs> Oh, the shock on Melissa's face. <laughs> Did he just We're talking say? about Grandmaster Flash. <laughs> it's just the mess of broken bomb. glass everywhere. <laughs> so they started out as studio musicians. And like a lot of people, they looked at the cool acts they were working with and kind of looked at each other and like, hey, man, we could kind of do this. So while they were 
On a trip to New York, they met London-based producer Adrian Sherwood. Sherwood would hit it off with them and start working with them, pretty much using them as session musicians. They created the Tackhead Band, but their first project would be Mark Stewart and the Mafia, featuring Stewart, who was formerly of the Sherwood group, the pop group. They would really release one LP with Stewart under that name called As the Veneer of Democracy Starts to Fade, which just sounds terrible, guys. Come on. <laughs> the album would be described as a, a scary mess of random sounds, spoken word, and a tiny snippet of music processed and distorted to a grating electronic edge, which just sounds horrible. <laughs> they would go from there and join forces with Gary Kalale, who was a touring MC, and release another LP called Tackhead Tape Lines, this time under the guise of Gary Kal Kalale's Tackhead Sound System. Still studio musicians, guys. Like, you're still not the main the main guys. They would have their, their first official Hackhead album, just them, would be called Really as a Hand Grenade. They would enlist vocalist Bernard Fowler to join the group, followed by a 90s, uh, uh, 1990 world tour. We're starting to make some headway. Now we're starting to get some of our own fame. They would follow that up with the album Strange Things, which some people would say uh, was a little bit here, but ultimately would not be well received critically. And they would be droppable. The members would go on uh, to continue as session artists or Sherwood, uh, Sherwood's artists over the next decade or two, as well as playing in different bands themselves. Like one guy started his own record label and he also plays in a couple jazz bands, but like nothing major. Like they never really hit it big after that, but they've been, they've contributed to some other stuff. But that is the story of Tackhead or otherwise known as Fats Comet. So. <laughs> well, Tackhead ended up going That's... in a different direction than what I thought it was. It, it, didn't, it turned out to be industrial rap, not in, not industrial grunge. <laughs> Something tells me they should have kept hanging out with uh, Sugar Hill Gang and uh, Grandmaster Flash. As, uh, those, they are still actually, you know, here we are 30, 40 years later, and they're still relevant, actually still touring. Well, let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. I am interested to hear where John lies on this. I think if, I mean, if we're able to separate Edwina from the storyline, <laughs> let's see if we're able to do that. Let's go give our final thoughts. And that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love to hear from you. Email us, goewiththeheat at gmail.com. I am not playing with you. I want to hear from you. <laughs> Email us, <laughs> goewiththeheat at gmail.com. Let us know what you thought about this episode. Let us know what you think about Sunny's therapy sessions. Let us know about Edwina. <laughs> <laughs> Dog murderers. All of them. It's a dog murders. Email us, goldtheheat at gmail.com. Be sure to check out that website, goldtheheat.com. Click on support, find all the ways to support us. Click on subscribe, find all the ways to find the show. Speaking of support, we would love your support. Support step number one, go to your podcast, your platform of choice, and leave us a review. Go ahead and give us five stars. You know the drill, five stars. Do it this time, though, please. <laughs> iTunes in particular, if you use that platform. But don't write a review. No one ever reads the reviews. Instead, write a eulogy to Edwina. <laughs> write about how great of a dog Edwina <laughs> was. And write it right there in the review of the show. Support step number two. Check out that Patreon. Patreon.com slash go with the heat. We'd love to see your support on that. As we're racing towards the end of this show. And, you know, more hints coming out about the reboot of Miami Vice. So, you know, you want to keep your humble Miami Vice podcasters. Mm -hmm. And we accept all different types of currencies. You got loonies? Well, we accept loonies. <laughs> <laughs> Screw that humble stuff. We're the greatest Miami Vice podcast on the internet. There is no one that has done a better podcast about Miami Vice than us, considering there's only one other podcast. So this is all you got. <laughs> <laughs> this is the number one Miami Vice podcast on the internet. We would love to see your support. We really appreciate everyone that listens to this show. So I like the kid. Support step number three. Email us. Go with the heat at gmail.com. Let us know what you thought about this episode. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals.